Calvary Ministries is very serious about discipleship. One man said this, Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. And we have a 14 lesson discipleship program where people show themselves faithful, they show themselves obedient, they say we want to be discipled, and they're faithful. We hook them up with somebody, men on men, women on women, who can disciple them and learn solid doctrinal truths so they're not tossed to and from by everyone in the doctrine. Uh, it's crazy stuff being preached from the pulpits and being heard on the radios and TVs. We want our people to know what they believe, know why they believe it. They have styled in their gospel. They can understand the Bible. That's very important to us. And we did I did a I did a little bit of a survey out of all the people that have been disciples, which is over 100 in 18 months. That's a good good thing. Uh, 90 percent of the people are still actively involved in the local church. So that says if you get disciples, there's probably 90 percent chance you'll stay in church. That's cool, right? Yeah. And so I'm going to ask that. Uh, which one's hot? Where's Joe at? Joe gone? Joe, you hot? Okay. This one's hot. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm going to ask that Jerry Freeman and Ron Freeman come up here. Where are they at? Very special. If you got three clothes back there, you can thank them for that. Part of these three clothes. Yeah. 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 You take this one. You take this one. I'm going to give you the microphone. You take it from here, okay? Call them up. Maybe tell you a little something about it. represents both their parents.
we started this deal out, I told him, look, you know, this ain't about me, this ain't about you, this is about what you can do with what you're learning. And uh, with that being said, every time we met, I said, hey, what are you going to teach me? <laughs> I think we spent about six months doing this deal, but uh, I'm proud of him. He put me through my paces and put him through his paces, and, uh, and I know that, that he's capable to go out and serve God and change lives. I'm proud of you, brother. We'll need this anyway. All right, we're not done. Uh, tonight we're going to preach about, we're going to learn about Exodus and uh, the Passover and, and what really went on there. But before we do that, I got a special surprise. I want to. I got a testimony tonight um, for you guys. This is one that'll blow your socks off. And so I'm telling you right now, I would listen and pay attention to what this young man has to say. And he's nervous as all get out. So please have mercy on him, okay? Uh, listen to him. Don't be get, get don't be distracted to him because I really want this this young man to give you what he's got. I'm proud of him. He serves in our church, one of our partner churches, Crossway Baptist Church. He serves here. He's a great man of God, and he's got a story to tell. So come on up here, Zach. I was looking at three class A felonies, which carries 30 years. 
these three unclassified felonies, which is a three-year mandatory minimum. The best case scenario if I pled out was 12 and a half years flat time. I started going to church while I was in jail. A few months in, I begged God for forgiveness. And it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. And I really didn't care anymore what was going to happen to me. After $18,000 in attorney and lawyer fees and 10 and a half months, they set me free. I was doing good. I got my job back, staying clean, doing good. Then something happened to me. You know how John tells you? I always just stay away from relationships because uh, it can make you relapse. Well, boom. I got in a relationship and within three weeks I was using again. I justified it by saying no one was getting hurt this time because it was just me using drugs. This went on for a while and I had another crossroad. The ATF showed up at my job site and questioned me about a murder case because my neighbor was severely beating, beaten, broken bones, all of his guns stolen and burned alive in his house. And due to my extensive Violent background in criminal history, I was the prime suspect. The prime suspect. Needless to say, I lost my job. A little while later, something amazing happened to me. My girlfriend, my girlfriend got pregnant. I remember I was on the roof of a building, apartment building, when she called, and I almost fell off the roof. So I was so excited. It was time to clean up, and I told myself I was going to be a father. It's time to stop using drugs. And not, sorry. I was still using drugs, but it wasn't as much as I used to use, so it was okay. I would quit when the baby got here. Then on April 29, 2012, at dawn, I delivered my precious baby girl up in my bathroom before the ambulance got there. It changed my life forever. I slept one time since then, and September 5, 2012, I woke up and I was surrounded by cops. And lo and behold, I got four more assault charges on police officers. I remember feeling feeling overwhelmed, which I know now was conviction from the Holy Spirit, that God was telling me, no more, my son, be still and listen. First Peter 5 eight says, be sober, be diligent, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a warring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I was clean for about a year and eight months, but I still felt empty inside, and something was missing. Then, then out of nowhere, my brother called me and said, hey, let's go to church. He was going to Crossway and Freeway. So I went with him. The first few times I didn't like it, I told him the same for me. But for some reason, I kept coming back. God got a hold of me, and I rededicated my life to him and told him I was all in this time. And that was a year ago last week. And since then, and since then, he has changed my life. I have, and he has changed my life and opened so many doors for me. I'm a single full-time father raising this little girl. Jesus. <laughs> I served in the ministry in this church with children and in my home church crossway. I serve many ways to give me the chance. And if any doors opened, I'll go there. I've been discipled. I'm now, I'm not saying I'm a perfect person, but we all slip, and God will forgive us for that. And that is an amazing feeling. You have seen, you see all things is possible through, for, uh, sorry, all you see, all through faith, anything is possible, but it's not always easy. I've been asked many times, if you could do it all over again, would you do it differently? And my answer is why? Why? I am who I am because God made me this way. He knew what it would take to, to make me to the man I am today. Well, Isaiah 10, 13, 12, 13 says, So for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your follow ground. For it is all to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquities. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own ways in the multitude of mighty men. Thank you.
turn to a two-year-old baby over here sitting down listening to that. I know his little girl. She's beautiful. He's a good dad. Think what, what he'd be if God didn't get hold of him. See, it's possible. Somebody needs to hear that. Well, I'm excited to preach tonight. Uh, man, I love that story. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for Zach. Thank you for Dustin. Thank you for little Alyssa. Thank you for your sovereign grace. How you take care of each one of us, Lord. Thank you for pulling Zach out of that muck and that mire and saving him, God, and using his story. Uh, decide, helping him be disciple. Plug into church, God. Thank you for that. You're changing career criminals and missionaries, Lord. And it's wonderful. And it's beautiful. And your glory is God. Father, I thank you for every person here. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for saving me. Father, I pray, Lord, that you help me preach my guts out. Like it's the last time I ever get to preach again. I pray for people in this room, God, to be saved, changed. That there would be people like Zach in here, Lord God, that change their whole life. Become parents and mother, fathers and mothers and wives and husbands and get serious about serving you and be disciples. I pray, God, that you help me do this. Help me preach. I need you, God. I need your spirit to work or it's useless. I pray for the people upstairs, the kids and the workers. I pray that you help them minister to the kids. Thank you for our youth. Thank you for Jonas. He's working with them. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. As you can see, there's altars on the floor. These two altars over here belong to everybody on the floor. Right there. At the very end of the night, I'll give an invitation. That's a time for you to respond to God. If God touched you, if God spoke to you, you know that you need to do business with Him, that's when you come. That altar that's hidden over here will be spread out. That altar belongs to Clarity. I want to say hello to Clarity Treatment. We love you guys. We love you guys. We're in Exodus chapter 12, the Lord's Passover. Pretty excited to preach this. I learned a lot of new truth. Not new to the not new to the Bible, but new to me. And I'm excited to preach it. Exodus, the Lord's Passover. Alright, here we go. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. If you got a freeway Bible, you can shout out that page number. 48, 48. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will, Exodus 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. This is God speaking to Moses. And will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, listen, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 21. Then Moses called. Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. You shall say to the, you shall you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in blood that is in the basin, strike it on the lintel of the doorpost, and the blood of the basin. And none of you shall go out of his of the door of his house until the morning. Verse 23. For the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians, and when he sees, uh, sees the blood of the lintel of the doorpost, the Lord will pass over that door and not allow the destroyer to come into the house and strike you. And you shall observe the thing as an ordinance, you and your sons, forever. It will come to pass when you come into the land the Lord will, will give you, as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? And you say to them, it's the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the house of the, of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered to our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron as they did. This is only one of the only times in the whole Bible that the Israelites obeyed God to the teeth. They are very disobedient. Verse 29. And it came to pass at midnight the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh that sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon to the firstborn of all the livestock. Verse 30. 
So Pharaoh rose that night, he and all his servants and the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. There was not a house where there was not one dead. How many have heard of the Passover? Have you heard of the Passover before? It's a special time that Jews and Christians celebrate all over the world. It's where, it, it's where the Passover began right here in chapter 12 of the book of, of, of Exodus. The first thing you need to know is this, that the Lord wanted this to be something kept as, as a remembrance of Him. That's why it's called the Lord's Passover. See, it was about God. This was the beginning of a nation. As, as far as I'm concerned, this is where the nation of Israel began. Right here. This was a time of severe judgment. For some, and there was a time of great liberation for others. See, there's some, this was a time of judgment from God. And for some, this was a great celebration of freedom. One, 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 one judgment coming from God. But two different, two different aspects, two different outlooks. It was the beginning of something new. This is the start of a new beginning for the Hebrew people. God called Moses to be the one who delivered the people from the bondage of the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh refused to let the people go. So God sent ten plagues. The word plague means to strike a blow. So God sent ten strikes to the Egyptians. You see, he said, I will allow the dead, the destroyer to strike your house. Judgment. God sent judgment over and over to get the people to go, to get them loose. But the Pharaoh refused to let them go. Listen to me. First plague was this. Water into blood. The first thing he did was he turned water into blood. Still didn't let him go. Frogs all over the land. That was the second plague. The third plague was lice. The, the, the Pharaoh, Moses said, boom, hit the ground. All the dust turned to lice. You know what the Egyptians said? The magicians who were imitating God, they said, Pharaoh, this is the bigger God. You better listen. He refused to let them go. The fourth plague was flies all through the land. You know what God said in chapter 8 of the book of uh, Exodus, verse 23? I will make a difference between my people and the Egyptians. The fifth plague, boils. <coughs> boils all over the place. Boils all over the line. Magicians who try to imitate God, guess what? They couldn't stand it because they were riddled with boils. Still wouldn't listen to let them go. Seventh plague was hail. God sent hail all over the land. The eighth plague was locusts all over the land. Guess what happened? The ninth plague was darkness. Darkness so dark that you could feel it, it said. But there was light in the house of the he still wouldn't let him go. This was the tenth plague. The plague of the firstborn. The judgment. God coming in the home. Destroying the firstborn of everybody who didn't have the blood of the lamb and the doorpost of their house. I'm going to get excited. This is the last plague. It will be different from the rest though because it involved the sacrifice. See? This plague involved the substitution. This plague will be the beginning of a new era for the Hebrew people. To this day, the Lord passed over. God was sending judgment on the land of the Egyptians. And there would be one who could escape judgment from God. He would stop by the rich. He was going to stop by the middle class. He was going to stop by the blue collar. He was going to stop by the white collar. He was going to stop by the poor man's house. Not one home would be left. first point I want to make is this. There had to be preparation for God's Passover. There had to be preparation for God's Passover. See? God provided a way to escape judgment from Him. God provided a substitution. God provided an innocent for the guilty. A lamb without fault. A lamb would have been taken. An innocent lamb. A perfect lamb. Uh, and brought into the house on the tenth day of Abim. The Israelites just had it. God created a religious calendar for them, separate from everybody else. The tenth day that God would, they would bring their, this lamb in the house, and they would keep it to the fourteenth day. On the fourteenth day at twilight, they'd take the lamb. It was innocent, it was spotless, and they would slaughter this lamb. And they'd take the blood, and they'd put the blood on the doorpost of the house, and they waited for God to move. The lamb would stay in the house for four days, careful examination would come. 
on. The whole congregation would come together and slaughter some slaughter this innocent lamb. Then they applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of their homes. Not one person could step outside that house. God was coming with judgment. Nobody would slip through the cracks. Not one person would get away or left untouched. Not one home would be visible. Listen to me. God didn't provide five ways. God didn't provide four ways. God didn't provide two ways. God provided one way. His way. That's it. It's a beautiful picture of redemption. Today, if God provides a way in this place for each one of those escaped children from, from, from hell and damnation, a perfect sacrifice for sin, a lamb without fault, an innocent for the guilty, and his name is Jesus Christ! That's Just like the lamb had to be examined by no fault, Jesus was examined at Passover, and the governor said,
face that midnight hour? You have to face it and I have to face it. Every one of us will be judged. Not one person in this room will slip through the crack. You say, I need the dumb case, you can't be his case. You say, I need the judge and fool him, you won't do that judge. I promise you, I can say tonight and testify standing here that I am a child of God. I accepted the blood stained cross as my own. I made it personal, put myself up there, stand up on the dumb screen in the cross, and I live, I live, I live, for Jesus Christ. I live. I am the Lamb. There's three kinds of people in this room listening to my voice. There are those who are ready when you come. There are those who think you're ready, but you know you're not. You're not ready. There's some in here that know they're not ready. For them, it'd be too late. All over their building, there's three kinds of people here in my voice. Which one of you? Do you remember how the Pharaoh responded to Moses when God warned him of the judgment? Do you remember? The first time the Pharaoh was warned, God had Moses go down when Pharaoh was doing his morning devotions to, the, to his God. 